you sent your son, who is a complete and wonderful, loving Savior, who has given us everything that we need and promised us all the fullness of your kingdom to come. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would meet us in our brokenness this morning, meet us in our need this morning, because until that kingdom does come, until we join you in it, we will suffer, we will struggle, we will have hard times, we will mourn, we will experience lostness, and we will know need. And so God, we come as your people this morning, still in this world, looking for a blessing, looking for assurance, looking for a reminder that yes, it's true, Jesus has paid it all, we are secure, Lord, uh, in that need, we raise up our brothers and sisters who are experiencing that need uh, in deep and profound ways. Uh, Lord, we, we think of Alice and her whole family now, the loss of, of Hap. Uh, God, it wasn't unexpected. They knew it was coming. But Lord, I pray that you'd be near them, and that you'd comfort them, that you'd remind them again and again of your love. Uh, Lord, that I pray that your, your people would be near them this morning, that we would comfort, that we would extend ourselves and love them well in their loss. And God, you know the loss throughout this room that others have experienced in the past years, months, uh, decades even, because we still feel that loss many, many years after we've experienced them. God, every time someone else dies, it's a reminder of the losses we've all experienced. God, I pray that you would give us again this hope that death is not goodbye, that heaven is real, that our hope is not poorly placed. Uh, God, I pray for all the, the planning that's going on right now, both for the fall, for, for Christmas, for, for everything that the church is involved with now as we uh, have Rally Sunday now coming up in a few weeks. Lord, I pray for our Sunday school teachers. We hold them up before you. I pray for Denise as our superintendent, that you'd be near her, that you'd give her all that she needs, that you'd prepare our teachers, that you'd prepare our staff for Wednesday evening, for home Bible studies, for adult Sunday school, for confirmation, for all the things that we have going on. Lord, I pray that you would bless our plans that through them your word would go out in truth and in spirit, and that people would be blessed, that people would grow in their faith, they would grow closer together. And Lord, now I, I pray for your Holy Spirit, that you would come now, that you would open our eyes, that you would help us to see uh, in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. If you've got your Bibles, uh, open up to Matthew. Ch chapter 20, verse 1 starts the parable, but um, we're going to actually have to go back a little bit to really get what the parable is talking about. I've said this before, but there's three rules to biblical interpretation. Anybody know what they are? First one is this word we call context. That's like everything. What, when you tell a story, you don't just walk into a room and tell it out of the blue. There's usually a context to it. When you give your kid a lecture, there's usually a context. Okay, we don't play ball in the house. Okay. You don't pull your little brother's hair. You don't write with crayons on the wall. So you tell them a story. There's a context to it. First rule of biblical interpretation is this word context. Anybody know what the second word is? Or second rule is? No, the second rule is context too. Third rule is context too. You really need to know where a story comes from. So there's a reason Jesus tells this parable. And you'll only really get it if you know what came beforehand. So Jesus is sitting with his disciples, and up comes a rich guy. And the rich guy says, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? So Jesus directs him right to the law. He says, you know the commandments. Don't kill. Don't steal. Honor your father and mother. And the guy has the audacity to say, all these things I've done for my youth. In other words, I've never broken any of the commandments. Rather than simply laughing at the guy, Jesus knows where he's coming from and tells him this. One thing you lack, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. The man's reaction, because he is a wealthy, wealthy guy, he basically drops his face and walks away. So Jesus makes the statement that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And his disciples who have been sitting there with him say, well, who can be saved then, God? Jesus says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now Peter 
pipes up. And this is uh, Matthew 19, starting at verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. Who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, Look, we've left everything to follow you. What then will we have? Okay, Peter doesn't have the audacity to say, he, he, I guess he's been with Jesus long enough. He doesn't say, Jesus, we've kept all the commandments and we left everything to follow you. Because I think if he said that, Jesus would have just laughed out loud at him. Peter, you've been with you three years. You know better than that. But Peter does say, look, Jesus, you told him to drop everything and come and follow you. Jesus, we did that. We dropped everything. And we followed you. So he asked this question, what's in it for us? What will we get? Jesus' response to him, Peter's not asking this out of... Uh, pride, I don't think, because Jesus' response is one of comfort, but then complete and total redirection. We usually think in terms of rewards and punishment. We think in terms of wages. If I work X amount of hours for you, I want pay for it. If I pick a humongous pile of weeds, I want more money than the guy who went out and picked three little tiny weeds and put them down. And if you walk up to each of us and hand each of us $10, I'm going to say shenanigans. Wait a minute. Something's wrong. I'm cheated. If he got $10 from that pile, I should get like $1,000 from mine. I worked really hard for that. We look and we think in terms of what do I get on the investment that I put out? If I work really hard, I should get a lot. And if somebody else doesn't, they shouldn't get a whole lot. So Jesus first speaks comfort to Peter because this is a question of Assurance. This is a question of, wait a minute, we're working really hard, Jesus. Jesus looks at him and says this, Truly, I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses and brothers or sisters or father and mother or children or lands for my sake, for, or for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But... Many who are first will be last, and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like... Okay, so this is now... In other words, so you understand this, Peter. Peter, he first speaks assurance. Look, Peter, you're going to sit on thrones. You're going to sit in judgment. The rest. But so that you don't focus on any kind of rewards, so you don't focus on all this stuff, you need to know this. The first will be last, and the last will be first. And here's a story to help you understand that statement. The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out in the early morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into the vineyard. When I was a teenager, I worked construction and wood floors with my brother-in-law. Um, whenever we would have a job that were just required simple grunt labor and a lot of it, there were about four or five different places we knew around wherever we worked in, a, all around New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Um, we knew there were a, a several places. You could just basically drive up in the morning, and there were a bunch of guys sitting around, and most of them were illegal immigrants. And I think the statute of limitations has passed, so I'm not going to get my brother-in-law's name, but you could hire these guys. You'd just drive up in your car, say, I need three guys. I need four guys. Some of the guys we'd, we'd known because we, we, we knew who they were, and we'd say, I'd like, you guys, you, you, you. And you'd agree on a price for the day, and you'd pick them up, and you'd take them out, and they were your help for the day. And sometimes you did really well, and sometimes they were not very good. You knew the next time, I'm not going to pick him again. But there were, this is exactly like that. The, the, the owner of the vineyard goes out in the morning. We, it's time to harvest, and I don't have enough regular help to get this job done. So there's a group of guys that there's a, it was the place to sit, and that was where you would go to find laborers. So he'd roll up, and he'd say, I need all you guys to come with me. At the beginning of the day, he agrees with those guys that I'm going to pay you a denarius. A denarius was basically a, a common day's wage. That was a livable, if you made a denarius a day, you, were, you could pay your bills. He agrees with them, I'll pay you a denarius for the day, come and work for me. That's at 6 a.m. 
9 a.m., he goes back out. After agreeing with the laborers for Daenerys today, he sent them into, the, into his vineyard. Going out at about the third hour, about 9 o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I'll pay you. So they went. He went out again, about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did the exact same thing. So 6 a.m., he hires all these guys for the whole day for Daenerys. 9 a.m., go to my vineyard, I'll pay you whatever's fair at the end of the day. Noon, same thing. Three, same thing. And about the 11th hour, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day long? Usually we like to hear that as like accusation. It, it's not. I say, what, what are you guys doing here? I've been hiring people all day. I, have you missed it? He said, no, nobody's hired us. He said, well, you go into my vineyard as well. And evening came, and the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. This is where you know Jesus is a master storyteller. Okay, he creates the scene. Normally you'd think, okay, let's start with the, the guys who've worked the longest. Here's your denarius, everybody gets their money, and they go, and you, they wouldn't even see the last guys getting their pay. You'd just get your pay and assume the guys behind you are going to get paid less because they haven't worked as long and as hard as you have. Jesus reverses it, says, uh, call the guys who've worked me for an hour, have them come through first. I want these other guys to see this. This sets up the tension in our story. When, the hire, when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius, which you put like a little exclamation point there, like, whoa, they got paid for the whole day. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. On receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last workers that I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Okay, so remember Peter's first question. What are we going to get, Jesus? Jesus first gives him assurance. Peter, you're going to be given two. But stop thinking like this world thinks. Okay, if your boss didn't pay you, would you come back to work the next day? What if it was a week? What if it was a month? Would you go back to work there? Or would you start looking for a new job? Would you consider it foolish to stick around and not be paid? Amen? And that would be, I mean, that's just dumb. That's how we think, and that's how this world operates. This world that we know works like that. We know it, and the danger is when we think that's how God thinks, and that's how God works. And Jesus is saying, that isn't how my Father thinks. Peter, assurance, you will be given to. But now I want to redirect your, your question. I want to redirect your thought. The first are going to be last, and the last will be first. And this is how my Father works. And as much as we think of service to God as much as we think in working in God's vineyard as labor, that we're getting something in return for, you will always be disappointed. And as much as you think your service to God, whether it's at the church, whether it's to your neighbor down the street, in any way, if you're looking at this as simply, I owe it to God, so I'm working for Him, I'm convinced in this life you're always going to be disappointed. Because you're always going to look at somebody else around you and say, why are they getting so much good stuff and I keep getting eh, okay stuff? How come they've got 250 channels and I've got 109 or 20? Or maybe you're getting it over air and you've got six. How come, how come they've got central air conditioning and I've got a fan? How come doesn't seem like anybody in their family is ever sick. In my family, it always seems like there's a doctor bill that's left to be paid. 
you'll always live in comparison to everybody else. And the worst of it comes when you see somebody who's a complete and total crumb who's loaded. Right? Does that ever bug you? Bug the psalmists. Why do the evil have all this stuff and God, we're your good people and we don't have anything? Read Psalm 72. It's awesome. You see this. We look around us and we live by comparison and we live by, I'm working really hard and why am I not getting? Jesus redirects, and this is where Jesus redirects Peter from the gift to the giver of the gift. See, listen to the story. The ones who came last were still given a denarius. This parable isn't just about the workers. It's really more about the generosity of the one giving. Is this guy a, a, a good boss? Hey, did he cheat the guys who worked for the full day? They agreed it was a fair wage. They all said, yep, that's, that's totally fine. So it is the, the giver of the gift. It's his prerogative how much he gives to each. And actually, he didn't give them more. He gave them all exactly the same. It's because the people who came first were totally living by comparison that they missed it. And they lost it. They didn't realize who the giver was and how generous the giver was. Now, if, if we look at this and understand within the church, it, it, I think it's, it, I wrote this note in my, in my Bible. It's like, how arrogant are we? We're the, the good church people. I think, personally, I've always arrogantly considered myself one of the guys who worked the whole day. And when, I, when you do that, you automatically put yourself, so it wasn't generosity on the giver's part. It was actually owed to me. I deserved that pay. I've worked for that pay. So there's no generosity on that part. It's very easy for those of us who have lived in the church our entire life to assume we're the ones who deserve it. I'm convinced we're supposed to see ourselves as the one who came at the 11th hour. who are getting what we don't deserve. Entry into God's kingdom isn't merit-based. If it was, we'd have a chance without Jesus. If it was completely merit-based, we could do it on our own. But remember the context. Jesus has just said, look, it's impossible for you to get into the kingdom of heaven. You think you've done the law perfectly? Well, the rich man really thought he did. But he was completely unnerved when his God was revealed. That he wouldn't spell all his... That he couldn't, he couldn't get rid of his hope. His hope was in his wealth. It didn't matter how deluded he was that he'd kept the law. That he'd really honored his parents always. Because the commands aren't just to, like from this moment forward. The commands go back. Did you always, have you always honored your father and mother? Okay, anybody in here think you always honored your mother and father? Are we all honest enough to say, <laughs> yeah, right. Anybody here think that they haven't committed murder? Well, you can look at my rap sheet. I don't have any convictions. I don't even have any accusations. But Jesus is the same one who said, look, if you look on your brother with hate, you're guilty of murder. Anybody ever lusted? Any ever, any, anybody ever been greedy? Anyone ever looked at somebody in need and then walked the other way to avoid them? See, the law isn't, it doesn't bend at all. And it's not even just from this point forward. Some talk about Christianity like a second chance. Like, okay, now I've got a second chance so I could get it right. If Christianity is a second chance... Christianity is useless. Because from this day forward, do you think you'll never hate? You'll never be greedy? You'll never lust? You'll never, boom, 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 fill in the blank. It gets to our intentions. It gets to not just the bad things that we should avoid, but the good things that we should be doing. It levels the playing field and all of us have failed miserably. None of us deserves the denarius at the end of the day. It is only through the generosity of God, the love of this Father through the Son, that any of us receive this. So by redirecting Peter, Peter says, look, what are we going to get? He reassures him, look, there's going to be blessings for you. You're going to sit on a throne in my kingdom. Look, there's a room prepared for you in my Father's house. If it weren't so, I wouldn't tell you. 
I have good things planned for my children, all of them. Stop worrying about what you're going to get in return for all the work that you do. Recognize the giver of the gifts. And all of a sudden, that work in the vineyard stops looking like work. I'm convinced that those who come to the party late, those who meet Christ late in life, those who would look back on their, their entire life and go, oh, if I could only go back. I don't mean too many late converts in their life who think this. Wow, I had it good. I got to party my butt off. I got to do all this crazy stuff. I got to sin like crazy and have a great time. And now I come to faith. I know Jesus, and I'm just so happy that I got off from all that work that I might have had to do. No, mostly when I hear people who've come to Christ later on in life, they go, oh, I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back. I wish I wouldn't have wasted all my time. I wish I wouldn't have wasted all my money. I wish I wouldn't have wasted all those relationships. I wish I hadn't broken all those hearts. I wish I hadn't destroyed. Those who come late to the party look at those who have been there their entire life and go, oh, man, what was it like to live in your father's house and know that he loves you. What's it like to serve him with all you've got? What was that like? I wish I'd known that. I look at those guys and and notice who they're focusing on. They're looking at, God has given me so much. God has given me everything that I have and I totally didn't deserve it. What's it like to be there? For those of us in the church who know this, is this good news? Does this make you want to do more or do less? Just knowing that God is generous, giving people what they don't deserve. And this is the gospel. Not that good people get good things, but that bad people get the best things. Sinners like you and me, people who deserve God's wrath and punishment, through faith in Christ are given the very best things. I think gratitude is a far greater motivator than pay. Gratitude, when you serve God out of gratitude, uh, do you ask how much time is this going to take and how much will this cost me? Or do you go, how much time can I give and can I give some more money? Can I give more of myself to this? Because you're happy about it. You're part of this. You're part of the vineyard. You're invited in. And this is the cool part. It doesn't matter what your past is. The worker doesn't go out there and say, which one of you is a hard worker? Okay, when, honestly, when my brother-in-law and I would go out there and we'd pick guys, if you were like really scrawny and skinny, we didn't take you. Sorry, we're moving lumber and other stuff. No, we need some big guys. If you were the guy laying on the bench sleeping when we drove up, we didn't pick you. This, this owner of the vineyard goes out and sees the people laying there, the people waiting at the end of the day at 5 o'clock. Who waits at 5 o'clock in the afternoon to get picked for a job? He walks up and says, come. Come to my vineyard. I'll pay you whatever, I'll pay you fairly. Come on. Come and work. So whether you're sitting here thinking, going, I've squandered so much. I've wasted so much. I don't even have much left to give to God. I don't have much time for labor. Uh, maybe you're just thinking, I don't, uh, I don't even like very good at stuff. God says, come to my vineyard. I got work for you to do. You'll love it. It's what you were made for. And in that vineyard is where the last and the first both find their joy because they discover what they were made for. Let's pray. God, I thank you for, I thank you that you're generous. I pray that you would free me and free my friends from thinking of you as if you were part of this world. That you would free us from the slavery of believing that you get what you deserve. That you would free us from the condemnation and brokenness of thinking we work for you and will be paid according to our labor. God, I thank you that through Christ we are paid according to his labor on our our behalf. 
that we get the best things, sinners like me. Lord, I pray that you would free us from that and free us to serve. Uh, Lord, I pray that in our church that we would be overflowing with generosity, that we'd be overflowing with, with work, that we would be joyfully serving you in this vineyard. Lord, I pray for the coming year. I pray for the future of all of us, uh, that you'd free us from all the constraints, all the things that keep us, that hold us back from serving you, and you'd release us to joyfully serve you because you've given us everything we have. Uh, Lord, bless us as we sing. Bless us as we give. Bless us as we leave this place and enter into your vineyard to serve, to love in Jesus' name, and to tell other laborers that we've got a good, good master who will pay them well. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. To understand that the owner of the vineyard is generous and loving and caring, and that he doesn't work the way we work, frees us. Move to the back of the line. It frees us to not have to fight to get everything we deserve. It frees us from having to be first and lets us let other people in front of us. It lets people be crazy and do stupid things, give generously, serve without looking to get anything in return because they know God is good. God's got a home for me. And he's actually given me the honor, the joy, the pleasure to be one of his servants. So go in the power of Jesus Christ. This is from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or even think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace into God's vineyard.